Well, for now, anyways. Hello, everyone, and welcome. It's Thursday. Brian here, and of course, I'm joined. I, well, you know, I, it wouldn't be the same sh show without him. It's it's uh, Thursday. It's Thursday. We had one of those last week. We did? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> this is a new one. This is a new Thursday. Oh, a new yeah. week. Uh, but anyways, I'm joined with my co-host, author, Daniel Payne. Yep. There's no signs. No more. They're gone. Yeah, I, 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 I need to rearrange my studio for more signage, but uh, I just haven't. So it's hard to tell who I am. I know, but yeah, it's me. I, I think my name's down at the bottom, right, right, right here. Right, right there. Yeah, yeah, it's right there. Right there. Yep. So I, I think have something out there, but yep. So it's been it's been a fun week. Uh, busy as all get out, but been good. And uh, I, I was I was gonna say this week I actually finally found online a copy. Uh, our guest we had a few weeks back, Mr. Tom Nguyen, who is the artist. Yeah, talks about a book that he did years ago that was an art instructional book that I picked up mm -hmm. um, probably 16 years ago, and it was one of my first that I really started studying the uh, um, details, the uh, art theory on doing basic drawing and art that I hadn't learned because I never took any classes in this, and I mm -hmm. lost the book. Well, the book's been out of print for more than 10 years. Well, I found one on eBay. There it is. So I got it. It's it's got the uh, um the library tag from the Toronto Library where they're selling out old books. Oh. So it's got some stickers on it. I wish I could take off, but those stickers are meant to stay, not like you know store stickers and they peel right off. This is meant to be on there forever because yeah. it's a library mark. So I I want to I love my new copy. I'd love to find the one I had because it was in great condition. But five years of looking, I finally just given up. But now I have at least I have one. There you go. So if I see him in person again, which I plan on it, probably one of the many conventions will cross paths in, mm -hmm. uh, I will bring this with me so I can show it to him. And he said if he did, he would draw a picture in here for me. But unfortunately, it also has library stickers. So, uh, but close enough, close enough. Right. So, Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, because that, that book really did have a lot of stuff that I use to this day. On, on basic art theory. It's stuff that most people who have taken the classes or done the work in school, they know. But I didn't. I never went to school for it. I'm all, I am self-taught outside of books and YouTube videos and stuff like that. So, right. so that's it's I, I, it's a great book. So, anyways, oh look here we have Jim Sadler here. I haven't seen you guys in a while. Morning, Jim. Where you are? <laughs> mm. And Amber, oh, and John Clark's on, and Valerie. Hello, everybody. Glad to see everybody on here. We're just waiting for more people. That's all. Our usual suspects are, are normally late. And I don't know how many people I've talked to today, just to let them know that I was having... Oh, there they are. See, the numbers just jumped. There it goes. Now everyone is, like, realizing that Brian and Dan are on tonight. It's Thursday. We have a guest. He'll be popping on hopefully a little later. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I want to thank Alexi Vandenberg, who has been sending uh, me recommendations for guests because he's been sending us some of these New York Times bestselling authors and pretty good, you know, very awesome guests. And the thing is, they're busy. So this guest tonight, I have had very little chance to actually talk to. A lot of the guests I kind of pre-interview and yeah. talk to a little bit, I didn't get to tonight. Yeah. Because he has his own thing he's doing. And right. so when he gets that, he's going to hopefully have time to jump on over here. So you may get more of just the two of us tonight, but that's okay. Yeah. We are the main attraction of the show. The guest of is just course. a bonus. Yeah, of course. Of course. You know, People that's the way I, I, I think of it. So anyways, so while, we'll, while we wait, while mm -hmm. we uh, for the guest, um, I guess I can just spill the beans on myself here for a little while. Mm -hmm. Um, so some big news is, is happening and I'm super, super excited because, um, uh, it all has to do with this cup, by the way, oh, everybody yeah. knows my cup. I like my Reese's cup. Oh you know? yeah. So, uh, I got this in New York city and, uh, cause I went to that uh, the candy store there in Times Square. 
the mm. Reese's or whatever it's called, Hershey, whatever it's called. So I got this cup. So, but now it seems as if though I'm going to be going to the factory itself, folks. Ooh. So I am going to be going to Hershey Park uh, in June. Nice. I've always wanted to go there. I'm going and I don't care. Uh, so, and I'm going to be staying there. That's the other bonus. Um, so, yeah, I've never been to Pennsylvania. Hmm. I'm sure so, you've driven through it. I don't think so, no. Really? No. Nope. Anytime that I had to drive to Florida, and I've driven to Florida five times, so I'm no stranger to driving long distances, um, I always went through New York. Oh, yeah, I guess that would do it. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to head down, down to North Carolina. So I'm going to drive through, go to North Carolina. I'm going to visit with my sister uh, and my nieces, her husband, see her house. Um, do a couple of things while we're down there. So do some sightseeing, some shopping, whatever on the way back. Uh, through Pennsylvania, I'm going to stop at Gettysburg, and we're going to do that. So I'm I'm finally getting to to do things. Um, it just took a little nudge, you know. To yeah, want to start doing things. Um, so yeah. So what part? Is it North Carolina? I am going to North Carolina. Yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, where in North Carolina? What city? I'm going to Asheboro. Asheboro. Okay. Yes. I, I used to go, I think, in Green Greenville? Greenville or is it Greensboro? I used to go up North Carolina once a year for a show that I would do back when I was performing with the Okinawan School of Dance and Music. And I would go there for a big cherry blossom festival. And that was always fun. But I spent a lot more time in South Carolina. We go to Charleston mm -hmm. on a regular basis. Charleston is beautiful. Mm -hmm. So, And I know North Carolina is beautiful too. So it's great, great area to see. Right there on the coast. I hope the weather is nice and you get to have a good time there. It should be. It should be. I used to live in North Carolina. I used to live in Greensboro, North Carolina. <clears throat> so not for very long, but it was a college town. Mm -hmm. I lived across the street from the college, as a matter of fact. So all the football games and, and whatnot. So when, but when yeah, was that, this? What's when, that? When was this? Oh. Oh. 2000 oh early 2000s my goodness i can't remember now because i i was going there i started my first one was 2003 and i did it until 2010 once a year i'm pretty sure it was in that time frame that i that i lived there yeah so yeah. We, we could have incidentally crossed paths and not known it that's there, true but... that is true yeah, absolutely. So that's just one of my destinations this year. So it's a toss up for the next one. Because look, things have changed because of COVID. Things will probably never go back to, you know, the same uh, for most places like Disney. You know, everything's changed. It's totally different. So I, I, I probably have already blacklisted it as my uh, future places to go uh, for now until things kind of change so i think it's time to start seeing the world just a little bit so i need to dust off my passport as my sister said because mm -hmm. uh, i've never used it so i think it's time we need to make a trip over to england and see jim in oxford you know i priced out it's funny you mentioned that because uh you know in 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 trying to figure out where to go i have this passport let's use it so first what it was the bahamas and, you know, it's not that expensive to actually go there. So, and, and I didn't realize that. Um, but I really would like to do Ireland as the mm, top oh, yeah. destination that I would like to do. <coughs> well, uh, that's a pretty penny there, folks. Let me tell you. Uh, unless you know people that live in Ireland mm -hmm. that you can stay with. You ain't getting away with not uh, paying out your patucci <laughs> for the trip. Let's just say that. Um, we looked it up, uh, and Disney does, does destinations through Disney. 
and I believe it was like, oh God, $13,000 or something like that uh, for two people. And it's a guided tour and that includes all your meals and stuff. So, I mean, it kind of was worth it. Oh wait, no. Was it like six grand? It was, I don't know. But anyways, it was yeah. expensive. Yeah. So. I, I looked at something like that before and it was, it was roughly 6,000 when I was looking at. Yeah. You know, it was expensive. It really was expensive, but doable at some point in my life, I would hope. Uh, but small trips for now, I think. So Las Vegas, I've never been to Las Vegas. I'm going to be going. I'm going at some point. Um, and my next thing is I need to know, like, a Comic-Con that you are definitely, definitely going to that is, I don't know. You know, maybe if you're going to be there for like two days or what, I don't know, however long you're there at Comic Cons. I know it varies per location for you. Yeah. But I want to go to a Comic Con and I'm going. Well, it, I'm this year, my schedule that is set is I'm going to be at Motor City Comic Con here in uh, Michigan, which is like five minutes from where I live. So it's right here outside of Detroit. I am going to be at the. Uh, let's see here, Rocky Top Games in the end of May, which is in Knoxville. It's more of a gaming convention than a Comic Con. Not not the celebrities and stuff. It's relatively small. Um, then there's Fan Fest, which is in Gatlinburg, and it's it's more celebrity oriented because it's Fan Fest for that kind of stuff. So it's not much comic as it is just genre stuff. Um, I have to look up dates on this. Uh, if you were going to go to a Comic Con. I would say either do Motor City Comic Con, which is here, or I'm going to be in Indianapolis in November. That one's the shortest one. I'll, I'll be there for two days. Here in Michigan, I'll be there for three days. At, and they see me all the time. But the problem is that I'm there to sign and sell books. Well, mm -hmm. a lot of these people have already got my books. And right. so I'm not as much of an attraction for the Comic Con for the people who run it and so I'm, I've been looking at their other location. They have one in Orlando. They have one in Toledo. They have one in Las Vegas. And they have one in Indianapolis. And I, so, uh, so pretty much you're do, you do book signings when you go to, your, to the Comic-Cons and stuff like that, right? That's the primary function. Yeah. yeah I, go, um, I go there, sit behind a table, and sign books, sell books, greet fans, that kind of stuff. Okay. All right. All right. Because I really do want to go to one. May is too soon for me. That's the problem. I've already planned my trip for June. I, I, I can't do anything until after June. So the plan was to for, to do two trips, hopefully. But, I mean, that's a small trip. So, I mean, I could fly out there and fly back, you know, sort of a thing. So I think that would be cool. Yeah. I, I, I want to do one. I would love to do Las Vegas. It looks like it's it, it's their first year to do it is this year. And it is a it's looking to be a big show. They've already got a lot of people signing up for it, like celebrities signing up for it, simply because they are that's closer to where a lot of these people live. So right. um, LA is not terribly far from Las Vegas in consideration to like, you know, coming all the way over here to Michigan or to, to Knoxville or something like that. So they're already getting names. They're already getting set of stuff set up. And, of course, it's Las Vegas, so it's going to have all that with it. That mm -hmm. one looks like fun. But for me, my problem is that I travel with a lot of my books. I do. I bring the boxes and stuff. Uh, and so driving uh, that amount of stuff across the country, especially with gas prices as they are right now, is prohibitive for going that far from me. Mm. In fact, I, there's a couple of these conventions that had I not signed up for them previously, and I do not like backing out, I may not have at this point due to the higher gas prices. Going right. down, to, I'm going to be going down to Knoxville or East Tennessee area multiple times back and forth. That's a lot of distance uh, yeah. for these Comic Cons. And, and some of these I'm doing, uh, to be quite fair, I'm doing as a favor because a couple of these are really small and people who were running them uh, we're like, we need people, we need vendors, we need celebrities, we need book authors. And I'm like, well, uh, and they knew me from other comic cons. I was like, oh, could you come to ours? And and at the time, I was like, oh, sure. I, I love East Tennessee. I'll go down there. I love this area. I'll go there. Well, I don't expect to make a lot of money at these. 
So it's kind of a, it's going to be a loss. It's going to be more for appearance than it is going to be for like making money. Right. So, but I, I am not one to back out be, in the middle of it because they're all setting up and getting things arranged. They've already advertised me being there. And I'm like, I can't back up. I'm not going to do that because that, that hurts them and they're already suffering. So, and the one in Knoxville, when are you going to be in Knoxville? Knoxville? Yeah. Knoxville is going to be the uh, end of May. End of May is my book signing in Knoxville at Rocky okay. Top Games. That, that's, that's the one that's the smallest, and they, they really were in need of new people there. So I, I was, and I, I love Knoxville. So, mm. ah, it looks like our guest is here. There he is. And so, <laughs> so I'm going to. Are you, you got anything more you want to talk about to announce? Anything new? Uh, no, I'm good. Let's bring our guest on for tonight. And uh, yeah. as I said, I didn't get a chance to really have much of a conversation beforehand. So I'm meeting him with you. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Jonathan. Jonathan Mayberry. Mayberry. Thank right? you, Sorry I'm late. It's been that kind of a day. I completely understand. So uh, welcome to the show. And I'm glad you were able to make it. Um, Me too. <laughs> I, did, did you have your AMA tonight? Yeah, I had the AMA, but also had a family thing that kind of just overlapped with that. And it was, mm. it was one of those days. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This, this I, I think at this, this point, I'm expecting also an asteroid to hit the Earth and something else, because it's just the kind of day where everything should be happening at once. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Been there. It's the day before the end of the week, you know? One more day. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah of course, and we have, we have April Fool's coming up, so things have got to get crazy. See now, if this was yet tomorrow, I would I would have said I'm late, but but April Fools and try to make a joke out of it. But no, it's just me dealing with family and, and work at the same time and and losing track. And I do apologize. Well, that's all right. We're glad you're on tonight. So as I like to do when we start these, uh, do us all a favor, introduce yourself, and tell a little about who you are and what you do. Okay. Well, I'm Jonathan Mayberry. I'm a New York Times bestselling novelist. I write in a lot of different genres. I write horror, science fiction, fantasy, thrillers, etc. Um, I, I write comics for Marvel, IDW, and Dark Horse. I edit um, anthologies, and I'm also the editor of Weird Tales magazine. I had a TV show called V Wars on Netflix for one whole season, um, and then COVID killed it because it was a we launched a show about a plague right at the beginning of COVID. You know, it's like great timing. I mean, holy crap! Yeah, um, it would actually do have done better now that COVID is kind of on the wane because people are doing stories about it. But right then, it was the wrong time. And I, I do a little bit of everything else. Um, I'm a retired uh, jujitsu master. I've been doing that for 58 years. And uh, there are no parts of me that are not held together with wire, screws, tape. <laughs> All the extra uses of duct tape and keep, keeping an old martial artist uh, up and moving. So that's me. Yeah, I, I knew somebody about like that once. They said they were afraid that some one day somebody was going to stick a refrigerator magnet to the back of their, their, their back and they wouldn't know it was there. I, you know, I have so many screws and pins and, you know, artificial knee and so on. I set off metal detectors everywhere. So you could probably use me to hang magnets. I should try it, actually. I should find a magnet and try it on my knee. <laughs> and it's funny when, when I get uh, x-rays because I've, you know, I was a bodyguard for years and a bouncer for years and competed as a, you know, Golden Gloves boxer, wrestler and kickboxer. I have so many, I have, I've broken so many bones that, when I get an x-ray, they see all these white lines and all my bones, and they think the x-ray is wrong. Like, <laughs> my life choices are wrong, and the x-ray is fine. <laughs> the x-ray machine is going, Phew, that was a hard one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we're glad you're here. I'm glad you're in one piece right here, um, at least wired together and all. Um, so... You listed an amazing all these accomplishments. New York Times bestselling. Where what book was this? Or books? So my first, my first bestseller was the novelization of the remake of The Wolfman, uh, with okay. Benicio del Toro, Anthony Hopkins, and Emily Blunt. Uh, but since then, I've I've had bestsellers in a couple different categories, including uh, quite a few graphic novel bestsellers. Um, uh, the first one of those was Marvel Zombies Return, which I co-wrote with Seth Graham Smith, who did uh, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. Mm -hmm. uh, Fred Van Lent and Dave Wellington, we each, you know, we kind of co-conspired on that. Um, my Black Panther stuff was was a bestseller. I, I I did the first run of Black Panther where Shuri 
was the Panther because the guy who'd written it before me, Reggie Hudlin, um, he knew that I had taught women self-defense for like 35 years and as a gift to me, had the Chalo get injured and had so that Shuri would have to step up to be the Panther. So I got to write that for a while and I had a blast doing that. And, um, and a few other odds and ends here and there. So, um, but yeah, the Wolfman started, started me off. It was my fifth novel, but my first bestseller. And when, when was this? 2010. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So that's, that is highly impressive. So how, how long have you been working writing with Marvel? Uh, I wrote, actually, I'm no longer writing for them at the moment. I have written for them. I, I worked for them from 2008 to 2012, 2011, somewhere in there. Did a ton of stuff. Uh, Wolverine did a bunch of Punisher stuff. Um, in fact, some of my favorite stuff I did for Marvel was Punisher. Uh, I did it. They have a, they had a line at the time. They don't now call Marvel max, which is their hard R rated comics. So I did a Punisher Marvel max. Um, uh, I did, uh, uh, I had my own imprint or own series within Marvel called Marvel universe versus first. It was a post-apocalyptic story. Um, uh, first run of it was Punisher. Then I did a Wolverine run. Then I did an Avengers run. Um, but, uh, I think the last thing I did for Marvel was a um, Black Panther thing, Claws of the Panther, I think was the last one I did. But uh, then I moved on to Dark Horse. And because I live now in San Diego, and we have our own comic book company here in San Diego, IDW, I decided I started writing for those guys. And the main reason I did that is much as I loved writing for Marvel, and you know, I grew up as a Marvel kid, so that was you know literally dream come true, uh -huh. I wanted to write my own characters. <laughs> so with IDW, I was mostly able to write my own characters, do my own books. Uh, the only thing I did for them that was not my own in terms of characters was a um, uh, George Romero, the guy who wrote and directed Night of the Living Dead, was a buddy of mine. Right. After he passed, they were trying to get some traction on a script that he started and somebody else finished called Road of the Dead. Would have been his last zombie film. Unfortunately, the script was so bad it make, made Hamlet look like Sharknado. I mean, oh. it was oh. that, that bad. Oh. But, but his his widow um, asked if asked IDW if they could ask me to write a prequel comic to kind of give that that particular um, uh, product a little bit of of gravitas. Uh. I, I went in and wrote something very smart ass, and so it was. I had fun doing it. It sold really well. Called Road of the Dead, Highway to Hell, and um, um, but the movie Road of the Dead will never be made. <laughs> we can all be. We can all rest easy knowing that that movie will never be made. <laughs> <clears throat> I, I gained a respect for comic book writing recently because uh, my publisher, uh, Cosby Media, uh, about a year ago, challenged uh, the authors in their house that have written superheroes to do comic books to help promote our books. Oh, cool. Uh, I've never written a comic in my life. I've always novelized. I always write stories like that. And, and so I had to do this and I had a lot of help from people sending me good articles from well-known authors in it and how to do this, how to write that. And I was like, Oh, this is easy. Comics are short. Not much there. Oh Lord have mercy. It was not easy. It took my writer's brain and just totally minced it. I got it done and I'm proud of what I produced and we're, we're about ready to release the comic itself, but awesome. I have learned. I, I've I've gained a lot of respect for the the art of writing comics over writing other stuff because it's yeah, it's a challenge. I mean, there's there's challenges in form. Uh, and by the way, if anyone listening uh, is interested in writing comics, if you go to my website, uh, JonathanMayberry.com, and it's Mayberry M A B E R R Y, not M A Y. There's a whole page on my website called Free Stuff for Writers, and on there is a sample of a comic book script. I think it might be one of my Captain America scripts. Um, and some other stuff that you can just download as PDFs to study the form and use as, as kind of a template. Um, but the, the things about writing comics, I mean, most people don't know that the writer has to has to decide how many panels the, and give the art direction for what goes in the panels. And we're writers, we're not art directors. So we have to be visual thinkers. Also, you know, I write books that are really thick and mm -hmm. comics are not. And I, I got one letter once, and I, I'm a dialogue guy. I love dialogue. So I, I, I sent in my script, and at one point I got a note from the um, uh, the letterer who was trying to fit, fit my dialogue into the existing – into the pieces – the pages of art that were done. And he's like, um, excuse me, but is there a chance you might want the readers to actually see the art? 
<laughs> Which is a very polite way of saying you talk too much, cut down your dialogue. I had to cut it down with like 80%. So there's a, there's a big learning curve in writing comics. But man, it's so much fun. I just finished my, my most recent comic was James Aquilone is doing an anthology of Carl Kolchak comic book short stories. Mm -hmm. so I just wrote one a couple of weeks ago for him and I was, it, it was so much fun. Yeah, I actually I borrowed onto my experience in stage and looked at scripts as I was trying to figure out exactly how to do this. Because in a script, particularly some of the uh, scripts I've worked with, you have your lines, but then you have in parentheses the setting or the action, or and it's like, oh, so I write the dialogue and then tell the artist this is what the person sees. And I write the dialogue and tell the artist, okay, this is what the person sees. You know, I don't have to describe that because they're going to see it. And yeah. That helped so much on my end trying to figure it out. I, I still, if I had to sit down and write another one, I would still be in the same hair pulling. Okay, figure this out. But I, well, I, I one, of, one of the challenges there too is, especially working with a company like Marvel, where they they have a talent pool that's global. Mm -hmm. The artist working with you may not necessarily understand English that well. So, for example, I was doing a Punisher comic, and my artist um, uh, Goran Parlov is Croatian. And he's, you know, he understands English, but he's not, he, he understands it better than I understand Spanish, but not a lot. Um, so there's one scene where, you know, I described the Punisher throwing a bunch of grenades and there was an inset panel where you see the grenades, the the, the spoons and the, and the rings flying, uh, pins fly, flying through the air. He didn't understand the, the parts of a grenade. So you had the grenade bodies, safety pins and spoons flying oh. through the air. <laughs> And for those who don't know a grade, when you, when you pull the pin out, the arming thing, it's called a spoon. It falls off. Mm -hmm. He didn't know that. So we had to get that art changed. And when I had him do a, a, a big splash panel set in Central Park, he made it look like the Black Forest. So I started including URLs uh -huh. in the scripts so that he can then see what it is I want him to uh -huh. use as an example. It's great for buildings and cityscapes. And and mm -hmm. when I was writing Black Panther, I, you know, I actually got photos of me with either me or my students um, doing certain techniques so that they would get the martial arts right. Because I'm a snob when it comes to martial arts. I can't stand it when somebody is doing something in a book, movie, TV show, or comic wrong when it comes to martial arts. Uh -huh. But yeah, yeah. do it. Yeah. Uh, Valerie asks, out of the books you wrote, which one is the one that you are the most proud of writing? Ooh. <clears throat> well, that answer changes on a fairly regular basis because you always fall in love with your 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 youngest baby, you know, your your, your latest work. Uh, probably the there are three books, and I, I can't give one. There are three books that I feel I was I really said, wrote something that to me is important, um, really important. Rotten Ruin, uh, my first young adult novel, and that. It's being made into a film right now by Alcon. It's required reading in 8,000 schools around the world. And it's uh, in the Reading Olympics. So, you know, that book, really, it's a zombie novel, but it's not about zombies. It's about you know, the value of life growing up and, and, and uh, becoming powerful in your own life. And also uh, when a teenager first encounters the real concept of honor, personal honor. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it, a lot of that. Uh, Patient Zero, the first of my Joe Ledger thrillers, uh, which is m my most successful adult novel. Um, and I'm about to write the 13th in that series, but that first one just really, I, I felt like I was in the zone for it. And my, my latest one that's coming out in May. Uh, it's my first epic fantasy. I noticed product, product placement. Uh, okay. Kagan the Dam comes out May 10th. Um, not only did I really enjoy writing epic fantasy, but I got a cover quote from someone who notoriously doesn't give cover quotes, Michael Moorcock. Um, he, we got a copy to him and he loved the book. Um, I also got, you know, blurbs from Robin Hobb, who generally does not like very violent fantasy. And it's a very violent fantasy. Um, she gave me a great quote, Shauna McGuire, James Rollins, the number one thriller writer, you know, mm -hmm. we had some real, and Kevin J. Anderson, we had some real huge support on the book. And it was something that, um, I never said, you know, I never thought I'm going to write an epic fantasy one day. But, but then the opportunity came along, and, man, I fell in love with that book. I fell in love with the whole process from coming up with the idea all the way through it. I was in love with it. And a week ago tomorrow, 
I, f I finished um, the second in the series, which will be out in January. First one out in the 10th. Wow. That's amazing. Those the, those people on, on the cover, that, that's some of those I know you don't find on the covers of books. M Michael Moorcock is 300 years old to begin with, and you know, <laughs> but he's notorious for not giving cover quotes. And so my editor got a copy to him thinking, well, it can't hurt to ask. And I'm thinking, well, since, you know, I've been trying to get him into weird tales, it could hurt to ask. Because if he hates the book, <laughs> he's going to say no to weird tales. He not only said yes, but he offered me an excerpt of the latest Elric novel for Weird Tales. So that'll be the cover story for an upcoming issue of Weird Tales. And I'm like, wait, am I in a coma? And, and this is like some sort of a fever dream, you know? Because, I mean, I've been reading Michael Moorcock stuff since the 60s. You know, I grew up with Elric and Hawkmoon and Coram and all those eternal champion characters. I know them all, you know, and, and here's that guy, you know, so holy shit. Yeah, it was like that time I was having tea with J.K. Rowling and she was going about my book. And then that stupid alarm clock woke me up. Well, you know, so one of the one of the weird things, I don't know if you know the author Delilah Dawson. Um, she's, she writes a lot of Star Wars novels. She's fantastic. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yes actually. She's great. And she was interviewing me at Pikes Peak Writers Conference a few years ago and just asking me at different points about the things that have happened in my life and my life has not always been good, but it's never been boring. Mm -hmm. And a lot of like spectacularly weird shit has happened along the way. And she keep, you know, she kept saying, well, that's not normal. That's not normal. Uh, I'll give you an example. When I was 12, uh, when I went to seventh grade, the, the middle school librarian in my school happened to be the secretary for two different clubs of professional writers. One that met in Philly, and that was Sprague DeCamp, Lynn Carter, and all the you know, Conan crowd. Mm -hmm. um, so I was meeting them. This is 1970, right? Meeting them. Um, the New York crowd was kind of like a rotating lineup of whoever was in town in New York City at the time. Um, so I, the first time I went up there, it's like Ray Bradbury, Richard Matheson, Harlan Ellison, you know, and I got, I, I became mentored by Ma Matheson, Bradbury, and Ellison for years. That's not normal. And I'm here. I'm this like, poor, poor kid from the inner cities of Philadelphia. Freaking Ray Bradbury, Richard Matheson. And then later on, we ended up getting the last cover quotes from them ever. You know, the last quotes they gave uh, before they died. It's like, that's not normal. Becoming friends with George Romero is not normal. Uh -huh. And none of this is the sort of thing that when you want to be a writer, you ever look forward and expect to be part of your life. Um, like knowing Stephen King, like, like, you know, that sort of stuff, like knowing Anne Rice. I never expected that. You know, I expected to be able to write and maybe publish, but not become part of that larger writer's community. So that still surprises me. I'm still, you know, inside, I am a fanboy and a book nerd. That's who I am under all this. So luckily, martial arts has taught me how to have a good game face. So like when I was at this, this convention in, in, um, in Texas and Stan Lee walks up to my signing table and Luckily, I have a really good game face. I'm like, Mr. Lee, how are you doing? Ah, oh, call me Stan. You know, I'm like, all right, I, I'm going to have a stroke about that later on. That's what I'm thinking, but at the moment, I'm like, okay, Stan. You know, and it 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 was to him. He's talking to a, a relative newcomer who's who's making some you know some moves in his in a field that he's been in you know since, since forever. But to me, the kid who started reading comics. In 1965, mm -hmm. Stan Lee is a demigod, mm -hmm. possibly an actual god, you know. So, no, it's not normal, you know. Um, and I'm grateful every freaking day that this is my life. I, I, as Brian can attest to, my, my connections have all been in actors. I've, I've got connected to and know a number of well-known actors. Now, unfortunately, that doesn't do actually a lot of good for the writing career. Um, <laughs> but I have a background in theater and in stage performance and all. And so when I meet people in person, uh, conventions and all, and, and behind the scenes and stuff, and get to talk to them, and we're talking and going, and they, more times than I can count, will look at me and go, you know, you don't 
act like a normal fan. I'm like, is that a bad thing? Oh no, no, you're 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 it's not like just person. I'm inside. I'm I'm a little kid going. I'm talking to this person. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Outside, I'm like I'm totally just. We're just people just having a conversation. Yep. <laughs> uh, and and one of the things about that, and I have, I have a, a number of actor friends as well and director friends. If you are visibly fanboying, it pull they pull away because they don't want to be on a pedestal. They're tired of that in real life. They just want to be normal with someone. Mm. And um, so if you treat them normal, they treat you normal. And uh, like some, like the guy who started in, in V Wars, uh, Ian Summerholder, he is, you know, Vampire Diaries, hugely famous. He and his best friend, uh, the guy who's now going to be the, the Captain Kirk on the new Star Trek show. Yeah. Um, the two of them have this bourbon brand that's that's making gazillion bucks all over the world. But when he and I talk, we're just a couple of guys just hanging out. And that's that's what he wants to be. He just wants to hang. Um, you ever watch sh the show Psych? Yep. So James Rodé Rodriguez, the star of Psych, is a buddy of mine. Uh, we mm -hmm. bonded because we're both big George Romero fans. And we were trying to sell a, a, a TV show together based on the book, the anthology George and I edited. And you know when we talk, we're just we don't we don't talk about his career or my career. We we talk about stuff, just a couple of guys talking about stuff, and it's very refreshing to be able to do that. But there is a part of me that is inside my head doing the Snoopy dance. Yes, I had lunch at one time with Adam West. Nice. He was and and it's a it's a it's a crazy story, long story. But he's such a he was such a nice person. And at a, at one of the first conventions I attended, not as before, way before I was an author, a, a an incident happened. His manager was rude to me, and I I walked away from the table, just like, oh, okay, so this Adam West is a jerk. Well, later he stops me and he's like, in that dulcet tone of his, "Did you want to see me?" And I was like. Yes. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> he, said, he said, "Well, they they prepared a very large lunch for all the actors in the green room, but there everybody went out with Bill Shatner for his lunch downtown, and I didn't want to go. Would you care to have lunch with me?" Oh yeah. <laughs> yes, I would. Inside Snoopy is passing out. Outside is like, "Yes, yes, I would." And we talked for <laughs> 2 hours at lunch during this time, and I was talking about his career. I talked about, you know, not in a gushing way. I was like, I, I saw you on, on a, um, Bewitched. It was the first time I saw you on a show. It was, you, it was a very different character. And then you were on Perry Mason. And, and he, he stopped me and he goes, wow, you haven't mentioned Batman yet. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, everybody talks about that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, well, just one last quick celebrity thing. My favorite celebrity moment ever Um so I, I, I was at this Comic Palooza uh, event, and I have a signing table sitting next to Walt Simonson, who's one of my favorite comic book people. Walt and Louise are just wonderful people. And across from me is all the cast from Rocky Horror. And, you know, I thought, that's really cool. I love this. I love the movie. I was in the play, you know. Um, and then at one point, I'm, I'm there, and Patricia Quinn, Magenta, comes walking across to me, and she's holding one of my books. She's holding uh, Orphan Army, one of my, uh, one of my uh, middle grade books for kids. And I'm like, okay, this is actually happening. Uh, and uh, I'm not actually in a coma. So this is real. You know. And she says, oh, I've been waiting for your line to die down because I wanted to get this signed for my grandson. He loves your books. Would you sign this for me? And I think I said, you know, something like that, 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 that. Because, you know, articulate. And um, and then we, we, we wound up talking for a long time. And um, she she's read a couple of my adult books, which, you know, is really nuts. You know, a couple of my, my horror novels. And she said, look, um, you know, little Nell's, it's her birthday and we're, we're going to have a, 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 a cake for her. Do you want to come back to the green room and, and join us? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> so I walk in there. It's the cast. Now, Susan Sarandon was not there. The rest of the cast from, from um, uh, Rocky Horror was there. Um, the cast from Gotham was there. And the cat uh, and... Um, I'm blanking on her name at the moment. She was in Firefly. She was the the, the girl who was a little crazy, but could, could you know kick everyone's ass. She was oh, in Terminator oh. series. Yeah, I can't remember her name at the moment. Yeah. Um, yeah. She was there, and um, uh, George Takei. And so we're you know, and I'm the only person who is not famous. And Jason Isaacs was there too. Uh, Lucius Malfoy. And he walks over to me and said, "So you don't look like you're on screen. Are you a?" A director, a producer, and I said, "No, I'm a 
novelist. And, uh, you know, Patricia's grandson loves my book. He says, oh, that's right. You're the one she was talking about. I'm like, she was talking about me. Okay. <laughs> I will I will need uh, alcohol later. And um, we, we, we sang happy birthday. We had cake. And then I went back at, at my signing table. And I have no idea. I'm sure the next 20 people who got book signed are probably disappointed that I spelled their name probably Patricia on every one. <laughs> but it was my favorite celebrity moment. I think uh, John answered this. Summer Glau, is that? Summer Glau, yes, thank you. Mm. Um, awesome. No, the, only, the best one I had on that was at a convention here in Michigan, Matthew Lewis, who played um, in Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. uh, he was, this convention was a great convention with no attendance. It was the deadest. Well, it's a no. long story there, but that it's I had literally to do with Detroit, not the commission itself. We're literally sitting around doing nothing. And so I get up and I'll go over to celebrities I haven't met yet and just say, Hi, I'm an author. Uh, would you like a book? I will I will I'm not asking for approval or anything. No. I just, would you like a book? And I brought my I write fantasy. I brought my fantasy book over to him and he he's very nice, but he was like, No, no, thank you. And I had a little thing in my head go, Oh. The, what kind of books do you like to read? And he goes, well, to be honest with you, I get so many fantasy books suggested to me and handed to me. I'm not into that anymore. <laughs> I'm like, you know, I kind of understand that. And so I said, what I said, I like science fiction. I had just published my first sci-fi book, Earth Last Starship. And nice. so I went and grabbed it and gave it to him. And he was very excited about that. And I was like, well, most of my hand to him, I know it's going to get stuck in luggage. It'll disappear. But I'll try. I got a message back a month later on Instagram directly from him saying, I read your book on my playing back. It was really good. Awesome. I was like, ah. <laughs> fantastic. So yeah, I, I've, that's the closest I've come to that. They haven't, they haven't pulled me in the green room yet. Pretty damn good moment, dude. You know? So anyways, let's, we, we, our show is actually running pretty good here. Um, talk about your new book. So cake in the damned. Um, I, my, my publisher or my editor had asked me if I was, had any, any interest in uh, epic fantasy. I said, I've been reading it since I was a kid. And he said, well, we're looking to publish some. Would you uh, pitch something to us? And so I sent him a pitch. He, he loved it. He got approval. Within an hour of that phone call, we had a deal. The story is set 50,000 years from now. Our civilization completely collapses down to barbarism, and it's a slow rise back up again. The level of culture... You know, somewhere between ancient Greece and Game of Thrones. You know, in terms of what you're, what you would, it would visually look like. That kind of sets the frame. Uh, there's nothing of our world that that the average guy knows because it's all in the past. Um, the hero is the, you know, this is not a spoiler because this is literally how the book opens. The hero is the captain of the palace guards, whose whose job is to protect the seedlings, the children of the of the empress. And the reason they're called the seedlings, the religion in that particular culture is based on harvest gods and planting and sowing, you know, that sort of thing, the agrarian cosmology. And um, he wakes up in a prostitute's bed, drunk, hungover, and the city is under attack. Um, the empire, somehow, the bad guys, this character named the Witch King, has managed to transport armies into every capital city in the entire empire and takes out all of the um, the governing bodies of all the ruling nations of, of these, you know, the nations that make up this empire. And he, they conquer the whole world in, in a night. And he fails to protect these children because by the time he gets there, everybody's dead. And uh, his own gods turn literally appear in the sky and turn their back on him. So hence the name Kagan the Damned. Um, and his whole thing is, is he, you know, he spends a good portion of the book out of his mind and drunk from grief. And then he gets his, his shit together and comes up with a plan to go back in, to that palace and kill the Witch King on the night of the, of the coronation. It's the first book in a projected series. I, I just finished the second. Um, it is brutal as hell. Um, it is politically complex. Um, it, in no way is it based on, on current politics, but it is based on the history of politics, of how nations have, especially empires and so on. And uh, even the bad guys have pretty good motivation for what they're doing, but they're going about it in a really bad way. Uh, there's humor in it. There's lots of action. There's sex and violence. There's pretty much everything I want to read when I read an epic fantasy. Um, I mean, um, 
uh, what's her name? Robin Hobbs said that I, I make, um, this is not a quote by the, it is not a quote on the book. This is something she told me. She says, I make George Romero look polite um, when it comes to sex and violence. I'm like, holy crap. <laughs> Please don't put that in the official quote. <laughs> um, I like George. And I, <laughs> um, but I had so much fun writing. It's a big, thick, meaty adventure. Um, and there's a lot of, the sword play is interesting because he is a dagger fighter, not a swordsman. And there's, there's a reason for that within the story. His mother, known as the Poison Rose, was the most feared fighter in the whole of the empire. And he now has her daggers, which are poisoned daggers. And he is a, a fighter. Me as a martial artist, I was always, my favorite weapon was a short knife. I didn't like the longer blades. I'm an infighter. Mm -hmm. so his method of fighting is all about being a smart infighter. So even though my background is Japanese martial arts, Kenjutsu, it's Japanese sword play and Jujutsu, I, um, I, I gave him a lot of the same technical philosophy of smart combat, not flashy. You want to kill this guy, get in there and kill him. And oh. if he has a longer weapon and is good at it, find a way to make that longer weapon a liability. And so I, I, I just had way too much fun. And also um, Rob Grom, who does the covers for my um, – all my Macmillan books did a gorgeous cover. Look at that. Yeah, I was admiring the Beautiful. cover highly. Yeah. And I just got the, the cover for the second one, which they're going to, the first one was out in May 10th. The second one's January 10th. So they're having me write these books and they're, you know, 180,000 word books coming out, you know, uh, pretty close to each other while I'm still writing other things. I'm writing four novels this year. Mm. So, yeah. I, I, I personally have a backlog of books with with two different publishers right now waiting to wor work on, but not quite that close together on release times. Yeah, it, it's it's been nuts. I mean, I my first novel came out in 2006. Um, the, the book I finished last Friday was my 45th novel since 2006. Um, so when they find, I, I have an agent who. Her, her thing is, you know, if I'm writing two books a year, she said, well, write three. And I'm like, but, 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 you know, she said, no, just get faster, write three. And then when you write three, she says, well, you know, I can sell four for you this year. So, you know, I, do I need a social life? No, I, I, who needs a social life? You know, ankle chain to my, my desk. But at the same time, this is the most fun job in the world. So mm -hmm. I'm thinking about it. I get to make up shit for a living and get paid for it. There is mm -hmm. no better job description than that. So, yeah. yeah. And I don't think I've ever had as much fun writing a book as I had with that one. Every As soon as I sat down, world building, every part of it, it was like driving the getaway car. I was having just so much fun. And uh, I think it shows through, even though the book has a lot of dark stuff in it. I think my passion and delight in writing this kind of a book, you know, just shows through. And also with the um, the publisher has this thing where, if anyone pre-orders the book now, they'll actually get a signed book plate. They sent me a gazillion book plates to sign. So they'll get a signed book plate. So that's cool. And you can just crack and peel and stick it into the into the book. Yeah. I, I, this, it sounds fabulous. And I, I would have to say that that's something I have learned over time is that when authors are enjoying the work, first of all, it just works better. But second, the reader will pick up on that. You are correct. And, and and so that's why there are times when I'm working on something myself and I mean, I'm sitting here pushing myself, hating the work. And I'm like, you know what? I'm stopping this because it's going to come through that I didn't like this. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, I've read books from friends of mine that um, I could tell I because I like I, the reason I know they were in a bad shape because they because they are friends of mine. I knew what was going on, family problems or health problems. And it does show up in the writing. And sometimes. Uh, some of my friends have been writing a series for so long that it's it, that's the series that is their bread and butter. They want to do other things, but the, but the publisher knows that will sell 10 times as many copies. And you can tell they're burned down on it. Robert mm -hmm. B. Parker with the last, I don't know, 10 of the Spencer novels, they were just so rinse and repeat. He had lost his passion. The earlier books in that series were brilliant. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you're, you're completely right about that. Yeah. It's which I, you know, I, I, I always recommend to people who are getting, come to me and ask questions about how to start writing or what to write. I always, I always say that, that definitely diversify what you're working on. Yeah. You know, if you, if you love fantasy, you love working on fantasy, step aside one time and write a science fiction. 
Well, you know, that's, that's incredibly, incredibly good advice for writers. Um, Richard Matheson, uh, one of my mentors um, in my not normal life, said, <laughs> told me that, you know, I should never let myself be pigeonholed. Um, you know, because you think of what he's written. Most people know him from either I Am Legend or Shrinking Man. He also yeah. did Somewhere in Time, Star of Echoes, What Dreams May Come, mm -hmm. Duel, which was Steven, Steven Spielberg's first TV movie. His stuff is all over the place. He's written mysteries and everything else. He, he would write the book he most wanted to write, the one he would be most passionate about, and then leave it up to his agent to figure out how to sell it. Um, and I, when I got my agent, I told her that story. And, and I said, look, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be Richard Matheson, but I am going to be all over the place. My first novels were horror. Uh, then I started my Joe Ledger weird science thriller series. Uh, I did uh, you know, The Wolfman. I did a, a, a book based on a, a, a role-playing game that I'd never even played called Deadlands. I had to research, and I watched people play the game just so I could get an idea of it, so I could get infused. And I fell in love with it, and I wound up writing a, a Deadlands book. Now I'm editing a Deadlands anthology. Um, and, in sh and in short fiction, you know, I'm all over the place. I, I love, I get a lot of in invitations to do short stories. I usually pick the ones that are either outside my comfort zone or just outside of the zone I've ever even thought about. Um, a perfect example of this, John Joseph Adams, one of my favorite anthologists years ago, had asked me to write a Wizard of Oz story. Now, my first inclination was I would write a story where the Tin Man gets the heart of a serial killer and goes on a rampage with his axe. And that would be a fun story to write. But it isn't really for the audience. And up to that point, I had never written for kids. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I wrote a story that I felt would really appeal to little kids. Um and it was in the anthology, and it got a lot of notice in reviews uh, because they said it hewed closer to the original books. So, it, you know, that was fun. It was stretched me as a writer, and I was pleased with that. And then about 10 months later, I get a letter from the estate of L. Frank Baum. And I'm thinking, oh, great. Now they're going to fry me for having you – know, um, and they said, and the letter was basically, we love this story so much. We feel that it's, you know, it honors the spirit of Frank Baum. We are henceforth including it in the chronology of the Wizard of Oz now and forever. I ugly cried when I read that letter. Uh, <laughs> now that would never have happened if I stayed in my comfort zone. And also my biggest selling books, uh, pay, uh, Rotten Ruin, which was, was my biggest selling book because it's required reading in so many schools and all that. I didn't want to write it. I had written a short story version of it for an adult anthology edited by Christopher Golden. My agent said she could sell it as a YA, and I, I thought she was, you know, out of her mind. I didn't, and I didn't want to write YA. And um, one bidding war later, uh, not only did she sell that first book, she sold a whole series, a whole series to Simon and Schuster. And now I've done seven of them, and they're making a movie. Sometimes when you stretch out of your comfort zone, not only do you grow as a writer and grow creatively. You open up such incredible doors of opportunity. Uh, yeah, I'm when I first got into publishing, I started in fantasy, young adult fantasy, and then I jumped right into superhero just for just for the fun of it. I did I published superhero. I've done dystopian fantasy, Christian uh, <coughs> Christian science fiction, dystopian in one book. Okay, and it, it's probably my best seller, Remnant. Nice. Um, it called? It's called Remnant. Remnant. I'm writing that down. And so I have, I'm also, and one thing that just grinds on me is I'll come across people who are professionals way more me. I am, I am definitely low on totem pole when it comes to writing professionals here. All right. They'll come to me and go, Oh, so you, you write all these. Why, why, why did you do that? Why don't you stick to just one? And I'm like, because I didn't want to. <laughs> and, and then my big, biggest compliment I've got, and people, I've had some people complain this, and I don't take the complaint as a complaint. It's a compliment. They all read a little differently. They don't, they don't feel like the same person yeah. written all of them. I'm like, well, it's because they're not the same world, the same right. genre. They're, they're, they're very different, you yeah. know? And, and that's, again, stretches right. you as a writer. You know, I, I'm a big fan of, of that. There's another, this is also a good business reason, too. If You know, like I write, like this year, I'm writing four books in four different genres, which means that I, and, and they're four different publishers. So they're not even going to compete with one another. So they can all come out and not, and, and, you know, if I put a weird science thriller book out, an epic fantasy and a military science fiction and a, 
uh, a cosmic horror book out, they're not the same genre. They're not competing with one another. Um, the publishers have no no issue as long as I get the books that I'm writing for them to them on time. Oh. Um, and that also is a lot of fun because Steve King, one of the, the first conversation I ever had with him, he recommended that if I'm going to be a high output writer, to have my characters, even if they're supporting characters, wander into different stories. Mm -hmm. And um, I found my readers really love when that happens. Yep. And I love doing it too. So Oh, it's a blast. I love doing that. And I, I find myself doing it more now, but I, I love doing that. Actually, Brian, who's my co-host here, he is in three different book series at the moment, and he gets cameos in several others just nice. for the fun of it. And, and, you know, and I refuse to kill him off. So he gets to he gets to live. <laughs> well, I, I've killed off a number of my friends, and also just written them into as ongoing characters too. Yeah. Um, my favorite friend death, though, I have a buddy who's a really nice guy. He's a Quaker. He's very you know gentle, good good spirited guy. So naturally, I turned him into a you know a, a, a murderous uh, child pornographer um, in a Punisher comic. I had okay. to blow his head off. Now. I did that just to mess with him and figured, all right, he's he's going to pretend that never happened. He's bought a stack of those things and, and gave it to all of his friends. <laughs> he gave his character the nickname of Dirtbox in the story. He's like, it's like, I need to get that license plate. I'm like, it's not what I had in mind. But a lot of a lot of, uh, of writers, myself included, do auctions. Like we just did one to support um, kids who are caught in the Ukraine, you know, mm. Um, where we auctioned off, um, like my, my thing was whoever wins the auction gets to be a, an ongoing character in my Joe Ledger thriller series. And, um, they got a lot of money for that. You know, they, it, was, it was a hotly competed auction. I'm like groovy. It doesn't cost me anything, but it makes it fun because the money's going to a good cause. Mm -hmm. and somebody else, they, they get a measure of immortality being in an novel. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. I, I've only the people I've killed off that are real people turned characters have been people I didn't like personal people I didn't like I I never go after public figures because I don't care they, they don't care about me I don't care about them but if there's somebody in my life that has given me that much grief I will take out a little aggression on them through <laughs> killing them off in a character in a book yeah. but I do I enjoy including people at this point I, if I put up an auction and just get a few laughs as a bid but uh, I, I enjoy doing it because people who aren't writers, who are readers, who love this, it, it a lot of times it's a surprise for them. I'll, I'll yeah. say, have you read my most recent book? Oh, yeah, I'm about to. And about a day later, I get, oh, my God, I'm here. And, you know, they're just blowing up at that. So yeah. I love doing that. And there's, there's two other types of cameos that are fun. One is, you know, occasionally I do put a celebrity in my book because I, I know a couple. In my first, actually my third novel, um, some friends of mine who I had met doing panel discussions at, uh, or you know, panels at, at conventions and become friends with, they all wound up as as themselves visiting this small town as the celebrities in a convention in the small town in the book when bad things happen. So you had James Gunn, who at the time was known for Slither and the script for the remake of Dawn of the Dead, who now directs Guardians of the Galaxy and, and yeah. so on. Uh, Tom Savini, Brink Stevens, and Debbie Rashone, the, the B-movie actresses. Um, Steve Susco, screenwriter for The Grudge, you know, all those folks were in that book. Um, but I also had Bono in a book, you know, gave him a couple of lines. And uh, just because, you know, I, why not? I was happy to be listening to U2, U2 when I was writing it. I got a note from him saying, hey, you know, a mate of mine told me I was in a book and I read it and it's pretty cool. Thanks. I'm like, all right, did not see that coming. The other type of cameo that's fun is when your writer friends allow you to use one of their characters in the cameo. Mm -hmm. And I've done a bunch of those. Um, uh, Larry Correa, who does the Monster Hunter International series, he uh, his agent Frank's has shown up in a couple of my stories, and I and he's I've written a story in his world. Um, who what else have we done? Um, Joe Lansdale, if you're familiar with him, is one of the top mystery and horror and science fiction writers in the world. Um, his Hap and Leonard characters series of I don't know how many books they had a TV series the last three years. They were in my most recent thriller, and F. Paul Wilson, who created Repairman Jack, just you know verbally beat me up and asked me why I hadn't put his character in one of my books. I'm like, of course you're gonna do that. So I've got a, I've got cameos from writer friends. Their characters will show up, have a scene or two, and then you know that'll be the end of it. But uh, if the reader doesn't know, it's it's just a character. But if they do know, it's an extra level of fun. Mm. So cameos are great. 
Yeah. I, I've had, I've had people suggest different ways of, of getting people into stories recently, as I'd like to mention, I, I last couple of years, I'm the head writer for an online game, superhero game. Cool. And so I'm writing stories and I actually calculated it over the past two years. I've done 600,000 words for the game. Just, just for their ongoing episodic stories. But the fun thing that I'm getting to do here is people, people who play the game come and they create their own characters. And then I have to go and take what they've created and put them in the story. Yeah. Um, well, that, that's, that's part of the media tie-in world. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and that's, I'm, there's an organization, the International Association of Media Tie-in Writers. And somehow I wound up being president of this. And then there are martinis involved in the conversation. I don't remember agreeing, but suddenly I have become president. Anyway. When you do media tie-in, you you do that. You 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 know somebody else creates the characters, and you have to write a story in that world. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know I've done I, uh, Hellboy story, True Blood, um, one anthology of Chud stories. Remember that old science fiction movie Chud? Oh my goodness, yeah, yeah. yeah the Chud story, John Carter of Mars, Sherlock mm -hmm. Holmes. I mean, all these different worlds plus the Marvel characters. It's so much fun, but it is a challenge because you have to be true to their character. But at the same time, you have to make it your story. Mm -hmm. And that's a challenge, but it's a fun challenge. Yeah. For me, it's I've created a world and a canon for this game. And then you get to create the character. And a lot of times we have, we have a profile you fill out of that character. And then I take it. What I always tell the players, though, since 99% of these people have no writing background, no nothing like that, they are what your average superhero fan it will do. I'm going to create a character and then give him godlike powers. And yeah. then I'm sitting there going, I'm having to fit your broken character into my universe. I will go to them and go, okay, this is what I'm going to make your character be able to do. And the rest of this is going to stay in your box. Yeah. That, uh, that's, that's what I end up doing. <laughs> people create characters that are are, are too perfect. Superman is a, is a completely flawed character because you know he's never going to get, I mean, if he gets killed, you know, come on. Exactly. Um but characters that are uh, flawed and nuanced are so much more interesting to read and certainly more interesting to write. Um, that's why I like when, you know, they make a film or do an adaptation of something and the writer comes along and really explores not the powers, but the person. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the show, the boys is, is really good for that. And uh, daredevil, uh, the Netflix daredevil thing really explores, you know, ground level characters you know they they may have powers but they're not it's there's no guarantee they're going to win every fight mm -hmm. and that makes it you know it allows you to, to really get into the story a lot more and in gaming i'm sure that that's got to be a big thing um i'm not much of a gamer myself but um having watched a lot of games and written about games um since then you can see when somebody has created a character that they want they don't want to start that character up here. They want the chance for the character to actually grow. Mm -hmm. Is you know, hero's journey. Maybe people have heard of that. You got to actually get there. You got to earn your right to, to win the fight. Yeah, uh, Jim Sadler on here. He is he's from the games where I actually met him originally, and uh, he he created a character named Flegel, and uh, he I helped him write the entire backstory for this character, right. include him on cameos throughout the story quite a bit, and yes. It's fun because his character is highly thought. One that I have found personally in writing heroes for mine, starting off with, is I make sure they only have one ability. Yeah. Maybe two, but the second one has to be very superfluous, like, yeah. like being able to transport but not fight with. Right. That gives you so much more room to work than uh, they can do everything. Superman yeah. would drive me nuts to write because wow. what can't he do? You know. Yeah. That's why with the Punisher, you, you kind of keep having to find ways to mess with him. Or, or shifts the focus from him to the supporting characters because, you know, he's always going to get, get his kill. Well, that's that's one note. Mm -hmm. um, that's why w what Frank Miller did with, with Batman, with The Dark Knight Returns, mm -hmm. he took a character that was silly and made it compelling because he, he's the one that really started building in the psychological flaws, the, 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 the damage that he has. And that's really great. That's why I'm, I, I saw the first episode of Moon Knight and again, you're playing a character who, psychologically speaking, is a bag of hamsters. Yep. So you know, there's nothing about that character that, that would pass any screening for any high security job because they're like, oh, you're way too crazy. Yep. But it makes for an interesting character. And I'm really, I really dig it. Well, 
I was going to say, we are actually past our normal time. We've gone over. <laughs> I'm so glad you're able to come. Yeah, um, I hope you guys invite me back because this is a fun conversation. Yeah, I'll be more than glad to have you come back on here and talk. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, though, real quick here. Uh, how do you know Lexi Vandenberg? Oh, um, I've done uh, signings with Bard's Tower. Okay. Um, all over the place. In fact, I, I just confirmed today five more that I'll be doing this year. And, you know, he's also just a cool cat. Love hanging out oh, with yeah. him. I met him through Kevin J. Anderson, uh, who's one of my best friends. And uh, Lexi, he's, he's, a, he's a cool guy. Yeah, he's, I actually just signed with his new publishing house. That uh, uh, So I'm, I'm now – he's my third publisher, but I, I'm, I'm excited to work with him. But I was just curious. I didn't hear any of your books in his publishing house, so he, he sent me a lot of his authors at this point. But I'm like, I didn't mm -hmm. think you were – Yeah, I, I don't publish with him. Uh, I'm, I'm, right now I'm, I'm – with Macmillan, Simon and Schuster, and a couple other companies, Athon, um, and the new and Weird Tales. We just launched our own imprint, uh, Weird Tales Presents, we're in partnership with Blackstone. But um, he's a good friend, and I love signing with Bard's Tower. And uh, so I'll be I'll be signing a bunch of stuff, the Kagan, the Dan book, and also a big collection of Black Panther comics that's coming out this year. That Reggie Hudson, myself, and uh, Tom Nehisi Coates, they collected all of our stuff together in one volume. So I'll be uh, doing that, signing that at uh, Barge Tower in Dallas, Tampa, and other places. Nice. Okay, so yes, people who are watching this now and who are watching a recording, just remember they have this book coming out. When, what's the release date again? Keg in the Dam comes out May 10th. Uh, I'm launching it in Doylestown, Pennsylvania, but I'll be touring different places. Um, and if anybody wants to order a signed copy of it uh, or any of my titles, they can go to Mysterious Galaxy Bookstores Bookstore Online. That's my local bookstore here in San Diego. And I'll sign anything, my, my graphic novels, my anthologies, comics, um, and novels and so on, you know, anything they want. And also, anyone who's a writer, if you go to jonathanmayberry.com, um, there's that page, Free Stuff for Writers. And um, so, yeah. Definitely check it out. Well, thank you for being on here tonight, and we will definitely be having you on in the future. Uh, oh yes, <laughs> having more more discussion. We've had several comic book related authors in the past few months. I wouldn't mind bringing you all back together in like a panel show where we could have be all awesome. that'd be awesome. I'm I'm count me in. So Wait, definitely, yeah. we'll, have to, we'll have to do some arranging there, Brian. Let's get that going. So, did you have anything I know, to ask today, Brian? No, I've, I've just been sitting here along with everybody else, um, absorbing all of this information. Um, I, I talked to a couple of people who have, who have read uh, a couple of your books and said, it's going to be an amazing show. Um, just absorb and sit and listen. Um, it's great to, to listen to. So well, it, it, your friends have a low bar, but, you know, I'm, I'm well, glad. <laughs> you know, I, I'm just glad that my friends knew the person coming on the show, you know. So, Always cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I definitely need to have you uh, back on, but I enjoyed it. I just listening and, and all the experience and things you've written. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Fantastic. Thanks, thanks Brian. Well, thanks, Dan. I'm glad you yeah. guys came on. This was, this was great. And I, again, I do apologize for being late. It's been that kind of a week. Yeah. Usually we have, we, we'll do like this. We'll start the show. Brian and I will yep. chat for a while and then yep. bring somebody on. So your timing was actually yeah, no, yeah, you. You're fine. <laughs> yeah. I would like to refer that, that conversation between you two guys though. So next, next time I'll, uh, I'll be here for the whole gig. Yep. Sure. Okay. Well, uh, say thank you. And, uh, anybody, any questions that pop up on the, um, people watching a recording, we'll let you know if you can't answer them. Oh, sure. Um, and so thank you everybody for watching and uh, brian anything else no that's it uh we'll just see everyone next thursday as usual so yep. yeah next thursday and remember remember april fools is is the first don't be that foolish but prank somebody <laughs> it, it shows you love them it or does. you hate them but either way it'll be funny yeah yeah absolutely good night good, and good morning sadler good night everybody else yeah <laughs> <laughs> thanks guys take care have a good